I'd like to tell you a story about how I got into classical education. My grandma taught me to read when I was three years old. I was such a precocious youngster that my mom decided to put me into kindergarten early. I have a September birthday, which comes after the general age cutoff for grade level placement, but my mom pulled some strings, because she used to work at the school, uh, to get me into a kindergarten as a not yet five-year-old. So I was four starting kindergarten. Um, as I began kindergarten, it became clear that I was, in some ways at least, slightly overqualified for kindergarten. Um, from a like curriculum standpoint, maturity-wise, I was a four-year-old boy. So no, of course I wasn't. Um, because apparently learning to read is like a large part of what you're doing curriculum-wise in kindergarten sometimes. I don't know. Um, I actually got in trouble that year for reading ahead in one of the learn to read books that we were given. Uh, because I was just like so bored, I was like flipping to the end to see if it got more interesting. <sighs> Unfortunately, it didn't get more interesting. <laughs> As a result of this, uh, my parents decided to pull me out of school and homeschool me the next year. Uh, unbeknownst to me, that homeschooling involved doing two years of school in one year. So by the end of that year, I was a six-year-old who wouldn't turn seven until September, who had just graduated the second grade. <laughs> This set me on a pretty intense academic trajectory uh, that would see me graduating from high school at the ripe old age of 16. All that to say, because I was 15 turning 16 when I started filling out college applications, uh, my parents were more involved in the process than the average set of parents, I'd say. Um, I'd pick out some schools that looked good to me, um, but quickly got overwhelmed by the vast amount of giant monumental life change headed my way. Um, so searching for scholarships, figuring out what I did and didn't qualify for, all of that felt pretty outside my bandwidth. Uh, so my mom stepped in to help out, and a sort of terrible rhythm developed to this whole thing. Uh, I would arrive home from school to find a fresh stack of scholarship applications on my desk. Um, so I would finish my homework in like all my AP classes that I was in, and then like eat dinner, and then after dinner I would just fill out scholarship applications until I went to sleep. Uh, as you can imagine, I didn't exactly work carefully through these scholarship applications. Um, in my mind, they were just another chore that my mom was making me do, which I begrudgingly toiled over, uh, despite my lack of interest in the project. Uh, questions often felt very, fairly similar, so I got to where I was mindlessly filling out applications, like a weird little like 16-year-old office drone rubber stamping documents. Um, but it just so happens that during this season of my life, uh, my mother heard about a program at Biola University. Uh, one of the schools for which I'd applied. It was called the Tory Honors Institute. It's a great books program that focused on reading, discussion, and writing, run by a certain Dr. John Mark Reynolds. I don't know if you've heard of him. Um, now, my mom knew nothing about classical education at all, uh, but she saw a particular distinctive uh, that she felt would appeal to me, namely that there was no busy work. Everything assigned in the program was uh, important and there was no time wasted on random nonsense. Busy work being my number one pet peeve in uh, all of my life up till now even, um, this made her think that it, it would be good for me. She became convinced, in fact, uh, that I'd absolutely love Tori if I gave it a chance. In her mind, though, there was just one problem. I had spent most of my teenage life in the unsuccessful pursuit of being cool, um, or at the very least being normal, uh, and I was unlikely to see Tori as either cool or normal. Uh, being young for my grade meant that I was always a bit socially awkward. Uh, imagine, if you will, a five foot tall, 12 year old boy with a mouth full of braces, stepping foot onto a 3,000 student <laughs> public high school <laughs> as a freshman. <laughs> I was doomed to be very unpopular. Um, it was an inevitability. And so I had determined uh, that college would be my time to reinvent myself. Right? I wouldn't be a nerd. I'd be popular. I'd be cool. I'd at least be normal. Uh, seeing this impulse in me, my mom knew for a fact that I would never willingly sign up for the school's honors program, uh, wherein you take different classes from everyone else, do different things, and are, I would later find out, generally branded as a Tory kid by everyone else that goes to the school. Uh, knowing that I wouldn't sign up myself, she decided to do the only thing she could think of. She tricked me into it. My mindless droning through scholarship applications served as a perfect opportunity. She simply slipped the Tory application into the stack of applications that were on my desk, and within a week I had applied to a program that I had never heard of. Even when I got an interview uh, in this stage of this program, which I learned later is apparently like hard to do, so that's funny, because I surely was paying no attention to what I was writing on that application. Uh, 
I assumed even when I was in that interview somehow that there must be money attached, and that's why I was being talked to about this. Uh, the glass didn't really shatter on that one until after I got my financial aid packet back from Biola, and by then I had already signed up to do all of these things, so I was sort of committed. My family has a really strong, like, you sign up for it, you do it till you die kind of thing. Like, that's the, the general ethic of my family. So that's how I got into classical education. Uh, I showed up a week before normal student orientation for Torientation. I looked around me at all the other nerds and weirdos. I say other because, you know, whether I liked it or not, I was still very much a nerd and weirdo. And when I saw that I was in a weird nerd company of weird nerds gathered for this special or honors institute orientation, my heart sunk and I found myself becoming incredibly angry. Here I was set up for another four years of being a loser. Yeah, it's really sad. Don't worry, it gets better. <laughs> You can probably guess how it ends since I'm standing right here <laughs> telling you this story in my job at a great book school. <laughs> so now why do I tell you this story? Uh, upon my arrival to campus, I was immediately checked out from being a Tory student. I wasn't interested in participating in taking the project seriously or in allowing myself to be educated in this program at all. So what changed? How did I go from that to teaching great text classes at a classical school. <laughs> Quite the 180. I've reflected on this question a lot over the years, um, and I think I've come to an answer. It's because Tori had built a strong, vibrant culture and was very, very good at bringing students into that culture. When I arrived for Torientation, I had already decided to quit the program as soon as I could. But by the end of the week, I'd started thinking, maybe I'll like stay on for a bit, see how things shake out. Ultimately, this because, was because I had made friends that week, and uh, whether or not I was interested in the program, but in hindsight, it was only because of the program that I had made friends that week. The whole week was particularly crafted to bring new students into the fold. Yes, we heard lectures, we met our mentors, we got information that we need, absolutely need to begin the year well. Um, for the record, I ignored all of those things. Uh, I, I couldn't even tell you a single piece of advice that was given uh, during those lectures. Um, but we also did, and this is what appealed to me, all sorts of seemingly random non-educational things, right? Our discussion group donned clothing of a particular color and competed against other new discussion groups in a series of games and challenges. We got free Chick-fil-A and went on a big beach trip with all of the other new kids. Um, what else did we do? We, oh, we uh, separated by gender and participated in top secret initiation rites. Doesn't look like Mr. Dalby or Mr. Muller in here, but I still worry that if I told you anything about them, they would spontaneously appear and then tackle me. <laughs> uh, we were all in the program together. In short, even though we all had lots of reading to do, even though my new dorm room was in a bit of disarray and really needed to be organized before school began, even though there were more obviously educational activities in which we could have been participating, we spent the week on what felt like a lot of very loosely organized fun. As I've said, coming off that week, I decided to give the program a chance, but I still wasn't all that invested in discussion classes. I'd like half-heartedly read, i.e. like I made a deal with myself that if I saw every word on every page that counted as reading uh, a book that I didn't understand at all, I would go sit in a room for three hours with people who were talking about that book and then leave and I would go about my very merry way. That's how I spent six hours a week every week just sort of staring off into the distance. Uh, but as this rhythm began, new moments of connection started to arise. At our mentor's recommendation, our group started meeting for dinner before our discussion class. Soon this turned into us going to the campus coffee shop for milk and cookies after session was over. It was punctuated throughout by various and sundry Tory events. There was the play, the optional sort of optional, you still had to go to them, but you got to pick which ones you go to, lectures, uh, a city immersion and volunteer weekend called Urban Plunge, and the single weirdest Christmas party that I have ever attended in my life. <laughs> it, but because I'd been connected to my classmates over the course of that first week, I was constantly buying in a bit more with every event that came up. Like, okay, my friend is the lead in the play, so I guess I have to go to that. That girl that I like picked that lecture to go to, so I guess I'm just going to follow her around and go to that lecture too. Uh, my group is so mortified and shocked that I'm not planning on going to the Christmas party, so they just kind of like made me go with them. 
At each checkpoint in the program social calendar, I found myself being drawn further and further into the Tory community, a place that I never thought I would want to be. Now, this all came to a head with an evening in the spring called Freshman Initiatives, wherein our orientation leaders from the fall walked us through a series of team building games and in doing so revealed some of the deep dysfunction within our discussion groups. I don't know if you can guess whether or not I was one of the sources of this deep dysfunction. <laughs> they then put us in a room together and told us to talk about our issues. And the conversation that followed, and I, I actually mean this, literally changed my life forever. I quickly became one of the focal points of conversation. You see, for all of my newfound love for my Tory friends, the people, right, the penny hadn't dropped and impacted my discussion participation at all. I was still gliding through classes, generally ignoring discussions and counting the minutes until everything was over. If you know anything about having a discussion, you know that having that sort of member in your group is less than ideal? Let's say less than ideal. Discussion is an inherently communal activity. It relies on the buy-in of each member of the group, and the quality of the education you receive through discussion is tied inherently to everyone else's effort. So in that random classroom, after a semester and a half of group outings and events and milk and cookies and dinners and weird cat-themed Christmas parties, <laughs> my group sat me down and said the following. Your not taking class seriously makes us think that you don't care about us. To have good discussions, we need you to participate, but you're not putting in any effort. If you care about us, you need to care about class. We can't do it without you. Now, I'm not always great at handling criticism, no matter how constructive or helpful it is. I've gotten much better at it in the last decade or so, but 17-year-old me was like really, really bad at handling criticism. So it felt like, I wrote small, I'm gonna say like giant miracle, um, when they said this to me and I felt myself react by drawing closer rather than by pulling away. Instead of growing defensive and keeping my group at arm's length, I took their criticisms to heart and it has, again, literally changed the course of my life. As I said at the beginning of this section, I believe that this was possible because Tori had built a strong, vibrant culture and was very good at bringing students into that culture. As you follow the threads of this story, did you notice the intentional formational mechanisms that were put into place to bring us into the fold and sow seeds of community? Surely someone at some point gave a talk about like group dynamics, the importance of class participation, what we owe to each other in the program, but as you can see, I have literally no memory of that occurring. I assume it did. Did it? I assume it did. Yeah. Yeah, it did. It totally did. I... <laughs> yeah, I was probably playing doodle jump. Um, Speeches, lectures, even classroom conversations were not enough to change my heart. Rather, I was won over by the culture that Tori had built. And this culture, it wasn't propositional in nature, though one could easily derive propositions from it. It was not an argument. It was not a particular book or a particular discussion. Rather, the culture was atmospheric. It was baked into the lived experience of every Tory student. It was part of the air we were breathing. It was present in the t-shirts that all of our upperclassmen mentors wore on the first day of orientation. It was alive in school traditions that I was always tempted to mock until I soon realized that no one else would laugh with me. It was the sacred sword that we had to jump over in order to receive a pin which signified us as members of the community. It was the promise of one day getting bonked on the head with a Bible by Dr. Reynolds at graduation. That's actually a thing that we all did. That I have a picture. It's on Facebook if you want to add me. Go find it. The culture was not an intellectual pursuit. It was an engagement of the whole person, head, heart, and hands. And because of this culture, I found myself ready to receive a hard word from my discussion group and change the way I approached education. The culture that the program built made its way into my group of friends and somehow drew me closer to them and helped me to take them seriously. One day, without my realizing it, I began to really love the members of my group. And through that love, I came to love the pursuit of truth. I hadn't really connected it, actually, until I started writing this talk, but that year of small, carefully crafted experience 
that felt as natural as breathing and that seemed totally unplanned was the first domino to fall in the long change that would lead to everything that I love today. School culture succeeded in educating my heart when my selfish appetites overwhelmed me and nothing could get through to my head. At the St. Constantine School, we seek to educate students for virtue, wisdom, and joy. In doing so, we ask our junior high and high school students to complete a rigorous series of coursework in the classroom. Students read dense, difficult texts and discuss big, important ideas. For example, in the sixth grade alone, students discuss the book of Daniel, Plato's Ion, and the Psalms, texts that faculty at this school have spent their entire lives thinking about and will continue to think about without ever reaching the end of them. As freshmen, all high school students enroll in my logic class, working through analytic systems that I first encountered in graduate school. They leave that class better prepared for argumentation and analytic thought than most college students. Not an exaggeration, literally most college students I have ever talked to. In an educational landscape wherein many high school students never advance in mathematics past Algebra 1, every graduate of the St. Constantine School must take and pass calculus. From 6th to 12th grade, students must take at least seven years of music classes, seven years of fine arts, and a minimum of five years of PE, all far outstretching the standards set by the state of Texas. The Texas Distinguished Diploma, in fact, which is the most prestigious diploma that you can get in the Texas public education system, which, by the way, guarantees that your student will be accepted to any Texas public university as long as they finish in the top 10% of their class. That diploma requires 26 credits for completion. We require 33. Our classroom education is literally world class. But as Steinbeck says, still the box is not full. We don't believe that the things I've just mentioned as impressive as they are, constitute in themselves a full education. We are not brains in a vat. The goal of a proper education is not to simply download information into students' heads. As Lewis says, we are not meant to be men without chests. If we are seeking to educate for virtue, we must educate with the understanding that virtue is not a solely intellectual exercise. Virtue is an activity an action. It requires a doing, not a knowing. Well, it does require a knowing, but a knowing then a doing, not a knowing by itself. If someone were to memorize the definition of courage, to know exactly what the word means and which philosophers have debated about it, this would not suddenly make him courageous. If it did, Peter Pettigrew would never have betrayed James and Lily to Voldemort. That's a quick Harry Potter reference uh, <laughs> for all you non-nerds out there. Or if Harry Potter's not your jam, let's, uh, let's consider the words of St. James. Be doers of the word and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror. For they look at themselves and on going away immediately forget what they were like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere, being not hearers who forget but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. Hearing does not equal doing. Learning about virtue, wisdom, and joy as a mere academic exercise is not the same as living a life of virtue, wisdom, and joy. For virtue to take root, it must be act out, acted out and practiced, not merely discussed. I'd assert that since we are all complex beings made of many parts, a full education cannot be an exercise of the intellect alone. Rather, we seek to involve the whole person in the task of education. This is why we as a school are so dedicated to music, to the visual arts, to sports, to theater, to PE. This is also why we're dedicated to retreats and feasts and the house system and festivals and field days and quiz bowls and concerts and dances and madrigals and weird Christmas parties. <laughs> Life occurs both in and out of the classroom and virtue is exercised both in and out of the classroom. So the St. Constantine School sets curriculum for both in and out of the classroom. This is where typically I do a deep dive of Plato's Republic and talk about his model of the soul and how it relates to education. Um, I don't particularly want to do that because 
I, I guessed as, a, as we were writing that you would hear about a lot of Plato today. And there was actually less than I thought. I don't, <laughs> but John hasn't talked yet, so. Um, <laughs> Plato is kind of a big deal, so I get it. Uh, so instead, I'm going to give you, forgive me, Dr. Reynolds, a speedy, shallow splash through some of my ideas about Plato. <laughs> but I can only do so on one condition. Uh, you must not assume, like actually, all of you must promise that you will not assume that what I'm saying accurately represents Platonic thought. I don't yet fully understand Plato, uh, nor am I confident that I know what the phrase Platonic thought even means. I don't expect to get to the bottom of him, even after a few hundred years of extra study on the new earth. Um, so instead, I'm just giving you some of my quick observations. Uh, it's very academically irresponsible, and I sort of hate that I'm doing it, but oh well. So without further ado, exactly two paragraphs on Plato's model of the soul as it relates to virtue. I originally wrote run one, and that didn't work. I went to two. Okay. In the Republic, Socrates and his interlocutors craft a model of the human soul that consists in three parts. The intellect, the spirit, and the appetites. The intellect is where the reasoning occurs. Spirit is where the will, or something like the will, uh, the spirited part of the soul is, in my opinion, the most complicated and difficult to explain. So for the purposes of, again, this shallow dog paddle through my ideas about Plato, let's, let's call it the will. Um, the spirit is where the will comes from, and the appetites are where our mo more base desires originate, such as hunger, love of shiny things, all that kind of stuff. So in a properly ordered soul, the intellect governs the appetites through the spirit. The intellect governs the appetites. I'm pointing because it's like head and chest and belly. That's kind of, you know, like chest, you're like spirited. You're like, ooh, yeah, doing spirited things. And belly, you're like hungry. And then head, you're like thinking. That's kind of how we locate that on the human body. So, so head governs belly through chest. Okay. In other words, if our spirit is aligned with and subordinate to our intellect, then it can carry out the orders of the intellect, thus allowing it to rule over our base desires and decide when they should or shouldn't be obeyed. Now, a virtuous soul is governed according to this model. Any ordering of the soul that deviates from it is not virtuous, but rather is enslaved to vice. If your appetites, just think about this for like a second, if your base appetites are making your decisions for your soul, bad things happen. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. The key thing is, then, for the spirit to be aligned with and subordinate to the intellect. Only a strong, well-ordered spirit is strong enough to rule over our base desires. Thus, education that serves the intellect alone is woefully incomplete. If your intellect has all the right answers, if it knows everything that it needs to know about virtue, but your spirit is not trained to follow and obey it, your soul will never be virtuous. The education of the intellect is necessary but not sufficient for the virtue of the soul. And the education of the spirit must be part of one's education if the soul is ever to be truly virtuous. So we're looking at education of the spirit, not just the intellect. I believe that this is why Plato ends the Republic with a story. Stories, and I swear I did not plan this with Mrs. Turner, nor did I plan this with Mrs. Gilbert. We just all think about the same things all the time because of God, I'm assuming. I'm not being sarcastic. I, I actually am assuming that must, I don't know. Stories have a unique capability to captivate the whole person. They can charm the irrational parts of us, causing the whole of our soul to love that which is good and hate that which is evil. Think of a story you truly love. It appeals to you not just on an intellectual basis, but on an emotional one as well. Reading Cicero's On Friendship did a lot to help me understand what friendship is and what a good, good friendship should look like. But friendship is important to me because I grew up reading The Lord of the Rings. Take, for instance, this passage from Return of the King, where we meet Frodo struggling to make it through the end of his journey on his own strength. Now for the last gasp, said Sam as he struggled to his feet. He bent over Frodo, rousing him gently. Frodo groaned. But with a great effort of will, he staggered up, and then he fell upon his knees again. He raised his eyes to the dark slopes of Mount Doom towering above him, and then pitifully he began to crawl forward on his hands. Sam looked at him and wept in his heart. 
but no tears came to his dry and stinging eyes. Come, Mr. Frodo, he cried. I can't carry it for you, but I can carry you and it as well. So up you get. Sam will give you a ride. Just tell him where to go, and he'll go. As Frodo clung upon his back, arms loosely about his neck, legs clasped firmly under his arms, Sam staggered to his feet. And then to his amazement, he felt the burden light. He had feared that he would have barely enough strength to lift his master and the dreadful dragging weight of the accursed ring. But it was not so. Whether because Frodo was worn by his long pains or because some gift of final strength was given to him, Sam lifted Frodo with no more difficulty than if he were carrying a hobbit child piggyback. He took a deep breath and started off. I did this to myself. It was very cruel. Because <laughs> we're about to just do it all over again, so I hope you're ready. Okay. Reading and discussing Kierkegaard's Fear and Trembling has helped me hone my questions uh, about faith and the courage that it requires, but I find that in my darkest moments of doubt, it's the Chronicles of Narnia that call me to courageous faith. So now I'll read some Silver Chair, wherein we join Puddleglum and his friends nearly succumbing to the spell of an evil witch who's trying to hold them prisoner underground by convincing them that the world above is a false one that they've invented in their own heads. The prince and the two children were standing with their heads hung down, their cheeks flushed, their eyes half closed, the strength all gone from them, the enchantment almost complete. But Puddleglum, desperately gathering all of his strength, walked over to the fire, and then he did a very brave thing. He knew it wouldn't hurt him quite as much as it would hurt a human, for his feet, which were bare, were webbed and hard and cold-blooded like a duck's. But he knew it would hurt him badly enough, and so it did. With his bare foot, he stamped on the fire, grinding a large part of it into ashes on the flat hearth, and then three things happened at once. First, the sweet, heavy smell grew much less. For though the whole fire had not been put out, a good bit of it had, and what remained, smelly, uh, what remained smelled very largely of burnt marsh wiggle, which is not at all an enchanting smell. This instantly made everyone's brain far clearer. The prince and the children held up their heads again and opened their eyes. Secondly, the witch, in a loud, terrible voice, utterly different from all the sweet tones she had been using up till now, called out, What are you doing? Dare to touch my fire again, mud filth, and I'll turn the blood to fire inside your veins. I don't know why she turned into a pirate at the end of that, but that's fine. <laughs> Thirdly, the pain itself made Puddleglum's head for a moment perfectly clear and he knew exactly what he really thought. There's nothing like a good shock of pain for dissolving certain kinds of magic. One word, ma'am, he said, coming back from the fire, limping because of the pain. One word. All you've been saying is quite right, I shouldn't wonder. I'm a chap who always liked to know the worst and then put the best face I can on it, so I won't deny any of what you said, but there's one more thing to be said even so. Suppose we have only dreamed or made up all those things, Trees and grass and sun and moon and stars and Aslan himself. Suppose we have. Then all I can say is that in this case, the made-up things seem a good deal more important than the real ones. Suppose this black pit of a kingdom of yours is the only world. Well, it strikes me as a pretty poor one. And that's a funny thing when you come to think of it. We're just babies making up a game, if you're right. But four babies playing a game can make a play world which licks your real world hollow. That's why I'm going to stand by the play world. I'm on Aslan's side, even if there isn't any Aslan to lead it. I'm going to live as like a Narnian as I can, even if there isn't any Narnia. So thanking you kindly for our supper. If these two gentlemen and young lady are ready, we're leaving your court at once and setting out in the dark to spend our lives looking for overland. Not that our lives will be very long, I should think, but that's small loss if the world's as dull a place as you say. Stories speak to the parts of us that cannot be reasoned with. They call us away from vice and towards a well-ordered soul. They invite us to gaze upon truth, goodness, and beauty, that we might fall in love with God afresh and renew our commitment to virtue in our hearts. Early in Plato's Republic, Socrates is heading home from the Piraeus, and with his friend Glaucon, when they are stopped on the road, Plato tells the story as follows. Catching sight of us from afar as we were pressing homewards, Polemarchus, son of Cephalus, ordered his slave boy to run after us and order us to wait for him. The boy took hold of my cloak from behind and said, Polemarchus orders you to wait. And I turned around and asked him where his master was. He's coming up behind, he said, just wait. 
Of course we'll wait, said Glaucon. A moment later, Polemarchus came along with Adamantus, Glaucon's brother, Nicaratus, son of Nicias, and some others, apparently from the procession. Polemarchus said, Socrates, I guess you two are hurrying to get away to town. That's not a bad guess, I said. Well, he said, do you see how many of us there are? Of course. Well then, he said, either prove stronger than these men or stay here. Everything in this interaction is going wrong. Socrates is being threatened, perhaps taken prisoner. Glaucon, rather than attempting to defend his friend Socrates, has already given in to the unjust demands of tyrants. Socrates cannot hope to escape by force, but worry not, this is Socrates we're talking about. He's the smartest person around. The oracle told him that there's no one wiser than him. So surely he can use his wisdom, his wits to escape. He asks, isn't there still one other possibility? Are persuading you that you must let us go? In his hour of need to defend himself and his friend from injustice, Socrates seeks to engage the intellects of his would-be attackers. He hopes that he might convince them through reason to abandon their wickedness and do the right thing. But Polemarchus responds immediately with a question that will sound familiar to every educator and likely every parent in the room. It has echoed forth from the souls of men since we first fell from grace. Could you really persuade if we don't listen? How do you educate an unruly soul, soul that refuses to listen to reason? What does it look like to educate the spirit such that it aligns with the intellect rather than the appetites? When I was a freshman in college, for me, arguments were not the answer. And honestly, neither was discussion. I refused to listen. And in refusing to listen, I could not even admit arguments for consideration. To reach me, to reach any student who won't listen, to fully educate the soul of any human being, argumentation is not enough. The intellect by itself cannot enact change. And if Socrates is correct, and if I'm correct about Socrates, then the story could save us if we were persuaded by it. Stories, as I've said, can educate the part of us that cannot listen to reason. And the only stories more powerful than the ones we hear, the ones that we hear, are the ones that we live out ourselves. This is part of why, despite being a low church Protestant, I love working at an Orthodox school. The Orthodox liturgical calendar is perhaps the most beautiful and effective curriculum for spiritual education that I have ever encountered. In keeping the fasts and feasts, the faithful enter the story of our salvation with their whole selves. They fast on, Wednesday, on Wednesdays to remember Christ's betrayal and on Fridays to remember his crucifixion, but it's not just an intellectual memory. They train their spirits to deny their appetites every week as they live out a small image of Christ's pain and sacrifice in their very bodies through fasting. The Orthodox feasts, too, serve as an immersion into the great story. Pascha is celebrated not just as an intellectual reminder of Christ's resurrection, but as a holistic enactment of that story in which every member of the church participates. The Paschal Liturgy is a feast that engages all five senses. If I close my eyes, I can still smell the incense wafting through the whole building. I can still see the priests' colorful vestments as they changed them and paraded around and shouted out, El Messiah come and Christos Anesti and he is risen. I can still feel the cool wind on my face as we marched around the outside of the church. I can still taste the delicious feast laid before us in the parish hall. All of these things have a lively, vivid place in my memory. And I've only been to one Orthodox Paschal service in my life. In this liturgy, the resurrection of Christ simply cannot be a mere intellectual exercise. It must be a lived story that engages your whole person. It can persuade the parts of you that an argument never could. And that is why we put such heavy emphasis on student culture at the St. Constantine School. Every year, we craft a story for our students to step into that might persuade the parts of them that won't listen to an argument. When I first started writing this next section of the talk, where am I at? Okay. I tried to outline the entire arc of school events that we do for the whole year. Um, I quickly realized that we have way too many things that we do to cover in the amount of time I would have left here. So for the sake of time, I'm just going to stick with outlining the back to school high school retreat, the four day retreat that most of the high school students just came back from. So if you're interested in uh, hearing me speak more about the whole arc, I have ideas, just ask me afterwards or later or something, I don't know. 
I'm around. So the first retreat begins with students locking their phones away and sitting on a bus for three hours, where their lives of necessity slow down a lot and lose the hustle and busyness of their normal daily schedules. They must then on that bus choose to be creative and entertain themselves or to sit in silence. I feel like I'm fine with both. Most chaperones prefer the second. Um, when they arrive at camp, we set the students to immediately begin crafting the story of their houses. We put them through difficult team challenges that shape the beginning of their group narrative. Are they triumphant in the face of adversity? Or do they desperately need to find a way to cooperate? Once working through these challenges together, they then compete against other houses, either finding ways to rely on one another and achieve victory, or coming face to face with how their disunity leads to failure. Two different groups this year. In a portion of that last competition, wherein they were supposed to be figuring out the, the solution to a riddle, had a student in the group that knew the answer to the riddle as soon as, as it was asked and either through their own timidity or through the group's unwillingness to listen, they did not answer the riddle for 20 minutes each and thereby lost the race and then figured that out afterwards, which is, I think, one of the most valuable things I've ever seen happen in like a 20 minute period of time. Once working, uh, wait, nope, nope, we already did that. Uh, they then are asked to work together to craft a banner under which their house will compete throughout the year. And the next morning, they march out onto the field under those banners for the first field day of the year that we have with just the high schoolers. They compete for honor and glory. They cheer on each other's victories, and they console each other in defeat. Ask your student to tell you a story from that day. I bet they have one. We had a concussion. Yeah. yeah. Minor. minor concussion. Yeah. We even have photos of the minor concussion before and after it happened, which is pretty, it's pretty sweet. After this, we slow down and introduce them to a different sort of rhythm, that of silent and solitary prayer. We carve out time for them to go and wait on the Lord, and we invite them to incorporate that practice into their daily routine. We end the day by watching a film together and talking about what we see, hear, and feel in it. The students behold beauty together and then discuss it. And then we wake up the next day and repeat all of these rhythms in one day, leading the groups through discussion, where their teamwork and problem solving is once again put to the test. Carving out that space for prayer and taking in the sunset together and looking at something beautiful. By this point, the time is no longer structured. They're crafting a story of their own. One that, if the retreat has been successful, follows the model for community that the previous days have laid out for them. This year, students decided to end the final night by having a dance party. Like, I think it was literally all of them together. Like, they chose all of them together to, sp to hang out. I watched them constantly look for students on the margins and invite them in. If one student was isolated on the outside of the circle, they could only stay that way for about 10 to 15 seconds before someone would notice them, go out and find them, and invite them to come back in. I watched them teach each other the Texas two-step and exhibit patience and joy as they learned together and laughed. I'm not at all exaggerating when I say this. That dance party was one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. The faculty all sat on the other side of the room and watched them do this for two or three hours. And at least two of us, me, Mrs. Gilbert, <laughs> were crying because we were so overwhelmed by the goodness and beauty and joy made evident in their interactions with one another. I really wish you could have seen it. I think many of the students were persuaded by the retreat. And I think many more have at least begun to be persuaded. When we returned, I already noticed more life in the classroom. Students who started the year completely checked out uh, were at least kind of paying attention. And those who were already bought in came back with a renewed energy and vigor for their education. And as the year progresses, this story will continue. The culture will keep being built, a joint effort of the St. Constantine students and teachers and parents. And I have every confidence that the story we're living and telling together will be a beautiful one indeed. Thank you. <laughs>